I'm somewhat of a more recent Mark Carney watcher. I knew him, of course, as the governor of the Bank of Canada, and I knew him as the governor of the Bank of England. And I know him as someone who is deeply involved with climate change at the United Nations. But his influence on Canada and how he's going to flex those influence muscles, I think will really come from his push for net zero. And someone who has been watching Mark Carney uh, for years and talking about net zero is my friend, Michelle Sterling from Friends of Science. Michelle, I thought I would bring you in because you really have been, I think the lead Mark Carney watcher in Canada. And you have been a bit of an oracle saying, you know, this, his push for climate change nonsense, this is going to really attack Canadians' households and take apart our way of life. And I think really the new vehicle to do that is net zero. And I think net zero is even worse than a carbon tax because a carbon tax is sort of just, it, it, it strips away that first layer of your money and acts as a scarecrow uh, for investment. But net zero is going to change everything from how we heat our homes to how we get to work to how healthcare is administered to the kinds of cars we drive and really mark carney's been the lead guy in justin trudeau's ear pushing this stuff right well you have to remember that mark carney spent 13 years with goldman sachs before he got into the banking business and uh, back in 2015 um or even before that, he and his his wife was uh, part of uh, Canada 2020, and they were pushing for carbon tax back then. So you can see that in our um, climate crimes or eco shakedown, which I think we did, I don't know, 2016 or something. But, you know, that's like his his and her track record they're going back to about 2013. So this is something that they've been pushing for a long time. and. Uh, you know, you have to look at Matthew Nisbet's work out of the States to understand that the green billionaires, um, which are mostly situated in the U.S., but not solely there, uh, they've been spending more than $600 million a year on local ENGOs to push for these kinds of policies, making it appear as if this is a grassroots policy. So Mark Carney has made his way up the ladder from Bank of uh, Canada governor to Bank of England governor, where, as he notes in his book, Values, that that banking position also oversees all the insurers of the world. Um, so there's tremendous power there. And these insurers all have, uh, you know, huge institutional investment funds, and they've pretty much been co-opted by the UNPRI. If you're signatory to that, you have to agree to abide by ESG standards. And, you know, so that has moved and shifted into corporate life where we have Mark Carney as the climate czar telling companies, if you don't toe the line on climate change, we'll bankrupt you, you know, which is effectively also what he did to individuals. He's been advising the prime minister through the whole COVID thing. And now we are deeply, deeply in debt. And you can see those figures in our blog post, the monumental financial challenges facing Canadians. Um, but we're deeply in debt. You'd wonder how a former banker would allow that to happen. But he does happen to be a World Economic Forum trustee, as does the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, Christy Freeland. And they do seem to be quite keen on the Great Reset. Now, you know, if you are a climate activist and you really think that there is a climate catastrophe, then it's probably because Mark Carney made famous the risky business report of two green billionaires, Thomas Steyer and uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, which was popularized by a bunch of ENGOs as well, and which found its way into the academic literature where they're pushing this thing called RCP 8.5, which you can see up here, this is the most extreme climate policy scenario, and it's implausible. It's something that would never happen. It would be burning more coal than exists on Earth. And yet this has become described by Mr. Carney and all of his finance colleagues as the business as usual scenario, which it's not. The business as usual actually is more the 4.5, which you can see is not a crisis, it's not a catastrophe, it's not an emergency at all. But 
in about 2013, when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued their AR5 report, they said, look, you know, there hasn't actually been any statistically significant warming since before Kyoto was uh, ratified. And Kyoto is the forerunner to the Paris Agreement. So think of that. There'd been a huge rise in carbon dioxide, but there'd been no warming. And the year after that, that's when the Risky Business Report came out. The year after that is when Mark Carney gave his influential presentation to Lloyd's of London, to all the insurers of the world. And um, that's when the whole concept of climate emergency started taking off with the Club of Rome. And their plan to solve the climate emergency is, of course, to build more wind and solar, do more cap and trade, and have a global price on carbon, which is one of the goals of the World Economic Forum. And it, one thing that's very interesting, as I rant on here, oh, it's okay. is that Russia has never bought into Kyoto, never bought into climate change. And in fact, in Europe, Russia has been very busy funding environmental groups to send them exactly down the wrong path so that um, Europe is now, uh, you know, really... Uh, bound and shackled by the energy policies that Russia financed these ENGOs to create. So we have to be very careful of that also in Canada because all these ENGOs are getting foreign funding and they're all supporting this kind of cap and trade, carbon pricing, net zero objectives that the carnies of the world have been pushing for well over a decade. You know, and you have to realize also, sorry, no, his uh, alma mater, uh, Goldman Sachs bought two carbon trading companies back in 2007, 2008, that were basically, they were dogs at the time. But just like with lockdown, where all the big tech companies capitalized and made billions of dollars, I think Apple topped out in the trillions, um, you know, uh, the, the, the push for cap and trade, for carbon pricing, for net zero is making millionaires and billionaires uh, of all these uh, companies. And, th and some of these companies, he's actually on the board. Like he's mm -hmm. on the board of Stripe. You know, he's on the board of Brookfield. He's uh, Parker Gallant wrote a very funny, uh, if not so sad, two part series called The Mark Carneyville is in full Bloomberg. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and in it, he counts, I think, about 19 different companies. So, uh, you know, he's also disputing this notion that Mark Carney might uh, take on the uh, responsibility of becoming the leader of the Liberal Party. And he's saying, well, why would he? <laughs> because he's making so much money and has so much prestige and power. Why would he bother? What you just saw was an excerpt from my nightly show, The Ezra Levant Show. Every weekday, I do a monologue. Usually it's about half an hour. Then I interview an interesting guest. And then we read my hate mail or my fan mail, whichever is more fun. It's only available behind a paywall, though. That's how we pay our bills here at Rebel News. We don't take a dime from Justin Trudeau. But the good news is it's only 8 bucks a month, about half the price of Netflix. And in addition to my weekly, sorry, my nightly show, you also get weekly shows from four other friends here at Rebel News. So you're getting 36 shows a month just for 8 bucks. I think it's worth it. And even if you're not quite sure, do it anyways, because we rely on viewers like you to keep us free and independent. I promise you I'll never take a dime from Trudeau. Just go to rebelnewsplus.com and click subscribe. Thanks.